Good afternoon. It is my pleasure and honor today to speak about the most important messages from this uh, prestigious conference. To start with, I would like to congratulate the forum board, Professor Mohammed Gunaymat, uh, the Arab Society of Nephrology and Renal Transplantation President and the chair of the forum, Professor Hani Hafiz, the president of Egyptian Society of Nephrology and Transplantation and the forum co-chair, Professor Tari El Paz, uh, the uh, president elect of Arab Society of Nephrology and Renal Transplantation and the forum scientific uh, chair, Dr. Amr Hussain, the uh, treasurer of Arab Society of Nephrology and Renal Transplantation and forum secretary, and Dr. Dina Al Latif, the forum moderator. This was very nice gathering for the doctors from Arab world uh, to speak about and discuss the most hot issues in nephrology. And so this is the meeting of the autumn between the Arab sort of nephrology and renal transplantation joined with the Egyptian sort of nephrology and transplantation clinical nephrology chapter. Uh, and uh, I would like to congratulate Professor Tari El Paz for the idea and for selecting the uh, the most exciting topics as well as the prestigious speakers within this meeting. All presentations uh, are uh, uploaded to the Egyptian Sort of Nephrology and Transplantation Virtual Academy, as you see here, and as well as the uh, Arab Sort of Nephrology uh, and Renal Transplantation uh, Academy. The first presentation was uh, to Professor Ayat Said about the non-diabetic renal disease in a diabetic patient. He went to consider non-diabetic pathology. I think all of us as nephrologists agree with this uh, statement that findings that are not characteristic of diabetic nephropathy include or predicted by short duration of diabetes mellitus, rapidly decreasing GFR because this is not the natural history of diabetic uh, nephropathy, rapidly increasing protein excretion, a good onset of nephritic syndrome, active urinary sediments, especially macroscopic hematuria, signs and or symptoms of another systemic disease, absence of diabetic retinopathy, and refractory hypertension because we may find renovascular hypertension in a diabetic patient. So all these data refer to pathology rather than diabetic nephropathy. According to the experience of Professor Riyad Said from Jordan, among 340 native kidney, kidney biopsies, 88 patients were, uh, non, were diabetic. So 25.9% of biopsies were taken from diabetic person. Here, the result. If you look here, the 60, 61% of these patients have uh, the non-diabetic disease in a diabetic patient. And this is the distribution of pathology uh, for the 88 diabetic patients, 34 diabetic nephropathy, and you can find the spectrum of pathologies, uh, focal segmental, glomerulosclerosis, mem membranous nephropathy, IgA nephropathy, tubal interstitial nephritis, acute interstitial nephritis, acute necrosis, minimal change, lupus, membrano proliferative, fibrillary, hypertensive nephrosclerosis, post-infectious, spinal nephritis, post-immune, amyloidosis, light chain deposition disease, and glomerulopathy. This means that we may find another pathologies rather than uh, diabetic nephropathy. And this is the comparison between Charma et al., Jordan Hospital, and Columbia. You can find different pathologies in a diabetic patient. So we, sh we should be cautious uh, in interpreting the data of renal affection in a diabetic patient because diagnosis of a specific pathology rather than diabetic nephropathy may indicate a specific treatment. The second presentation was very interesting as well, a renal protection of anti-diabetic drugs and was presented by Dr. Dina Abdul Latif. And through the presentation, Dr. Dina uh, represented the different armamentarium of anti-diabetic drugs and she highlighted that metformin, you can say it is the great drug because of uh, um, nephroprotective effects of metformin, as well as the new drugs 
specialist sodium glucose co-transporter to inhibitors. And this is, and she referred to this article that showed the mechanisms from basic research of metformin nephroprotection through phosphorylation of acetyl CoO carboxylase by MB kinase. And this will lead to reduction of fibrosis uh, in animal model. New oral therapies with proven benefits beyond the glycemic control, especially sodium glucose co-transporter to inhibitors and glibone receptor agonists because they are associated with weight loss, metformin is associated with weight neutral, blood pressure reduction, cardiovascular protection, and delaying the progression of CKD with proven, ne proven nephroprotection. Then I'll, uh, I completed the issue of prevention of diabetic kidney disease and this is one of the important slides it showed at a glance that the management of diabetic kidney disease should include addressing blood pressure, albuminuria, glycemic control, and the, if we are dealing with patients with early stages of CKD, stage 1 and 2, we should be intensive in our management of glycemic state. But later on, we are afraid of hypoglycemia. We should consider treatment of dyslipidemia by using statin therapy to uh, add one of important uh, risk factor modification for cardiovascular disease. Dietary uh, diets and, and nutrition is very important and crucial, and we should uh, advocate sodium restriction because sodium restriction has an uh, uh, antiprotonic effect Advise all patients to lose weight if body mass index above 50, 25 kilograms per square meter. Advise all patients to quit smoking. Physical activity is of paramount importance. And uh, if you go to this textbook, uh, including 540 pages, and the book title is Diabetic Nephropathy, and this book includes a lot of chapters discussing the issue of diabetic nephropathy from different aspects, and I recommend this book. One of the important messages that we learn from a nephrology unit at Eurogen Nephrology Center is we should work in a team because we are partnering for the success. And treating, treating diabetic kidney disease should be in a team, multidisciplinary, and working together. Professor Walid Masoud. Uh, presented the dialysis in the diabetic patient. And one of the important message within the, this lecture is indications to initiate dialysis, uh, indications to initiate dialysis in a diabetic patient is similar to non-diabetic. There is no benefits from starting early. So the um, uh, being diabetic doesn't mean that we should start dialysis earlier. Online hemodial filtration may be beneficial if available until long-term studies are available. Although rare, diabetic acidosis presents with extracellular edema rather than dehydration. Hemodialysis affects blood glucose levels and it may cause hypoglycemia or dialysis-induced hyperglycemia. And the, uh, there is a recommendation to measure pre-dialysis glucose frequently in diabetic dialysis patients. Intermittent hibernization doesn't carry excess risk uh, of retinal or vitreous hemorrhage in diabetic dialysis patients when compared to non-diabetic pa non patients. To avoid intradialytic hemodynamic changes due to autonomic neuropathy, longer dialysis with lower ultrafiltration rates may be advocated. Low bone turnover, mineral uh, bone density and mineral bone disorders is more common in diabetic dialysis patients. Then, Professor Muhammad Salah presented the and highlighted uh, the overview about post transplant diabetes mellitus. And uh, this, uh, uh, this slide demonstrates the risk factors of uh, post transplant diabetes, including pre transplant factors and post transplant factors. Pre transplant factors include genetic variation, older age, family history of diabetes, African American, uh, hepatitis C, obesity, and inflammation. The post transplant factors include uh, the, uh, the creation. Uh, cessation of dialysis, improved appetite and relaxed diet and obesity, and immune suppressive medications, including diuretics, calcium inhibitors, and immature inhibitors, as well as infections like CMV. And all these factors either 
reduce insulin sensitivity or reduce insulin production. One of the important message is uh, we should know the anti-diabetic drugs after transplantation. He went to them and to respect the drug modifications according to the graft function. And one uh, important message is to know the drug-drug interactions between immune suppressive drugs and anti-diabetic drug. For example, ribaglonide is not recommended with uh, cyclosporin because cyclosporin increases glimepiride level leading to a hypoglycemia. Professor Kamala Wakasha presented the new insight of the management of hypertension in coronary kidney disease. And he demonstrated that hypertension is common in coronary kidney disease with increasing prevalence with its progression. And new international guidelines stress the individual approach to defining uh, the target blood pressure with respect to age, severity of albuminuria, and the presence, presence of cardiovascular comorbidities. Target blood pressure is essential to reduce cardiovascular disease and retard the progression of chronic kidney disease. Uh, lifestyle modification, uh, modifications remain a coronary stone of management. Agents blocking the renal and angiotensin system are being of choice in chronic disease patients for their antiprotonoric and cardioprotective effects. Dual blockade of RAS was using ACE inhibitors and ARPs are not recommended. Device based therapies are not recommended for routine assessed treatment of hypertension. Then, Professor Hussein Al Fishawi showed the crosstalk between heart and the kidney, chronic kidney disease, and heart failure a dual challenge, and he uh, convinced all of us that it is a dual a challenge. And the relationship between heart and the kidney is bidirectional. So kidney affect ha affects heart and heart affects kidney. Although there are many landmark clinical guidelines for managing heart failure, as well as coronary kidney disease, there are no agreed guidelines for managing patients with cardiorenal and or renocardiac syndromes. Uh, Professor El Fishawi mentioned the uh, stepwise approach for managing heart failure by using drugs in, uh, according to New York Heart Association grading. And you can see in this slide, for each grade, uh, there is a special preference to the use certain drugs. Then, uh, Dr. Professor Amara. Uh, mentioned the European uh, Cardiology uh, so Society of Cardiology guidelines this year for diagnosis and the management of hypertension. And this is the definition of blood pressure according to the, the society in comparison to the American society. So according to the European, we have optimal, normal, high normal, grade one, two, and three hypertension. So optimal blood pressure in adult is less than 120, and the stool 80. Normal, between 120 to 129 systolic, 80 to 84 diastolic. High normal, between 130 to 139, 85 to 89. And then grade one, grade two, and grade three hypertension uh, uh, according to these values. In comparison to the American uh, Cardiology uh, Association and the American Heart Association, you can find here Blood pressure above 130 is considered hypertension. This is the major difference between European sort of cardiology and American uh, cardiology uh, guidelines. However, they are different in definitions, but I think the treatment goals is uh, similar. And so these are the, uh, the key messages from the European sort of cardiology. Lifestyle changes are recommended for all patients with high normal, blood pressure or hypertension, but uptake and the persistence with lifestyle changes is a challenge for many persons. These guidelines normalize the concept that initial treatment for most hypertensive patients should be with a combination of two drugs, not a single drug. These guidelines recommend single pill combinations of two or three drugs to treat most people with hypertension to improve adherence to treatment and blood pressure control. This line, uh, guidelines, these guidelines recommend a simple core treatment strategy of RAS blocker 
ايس انهبيتور اور اه انجيوتنسين سيرين سيبتو بلوكر بلس كالسيوم شان بلوكر اور ثايزايد اور ثايزايد لايك ديوريتكس اور اول ثري توجذر فور موست او بيشنس بيتا بلوكرز ار تو بي يوزد ات اني ستيب وين سبيسيفيكلي انديكيتد ذن بروفيسور لامياء uh, اسماعيل Discuss the issue of dual RAS blockade. Should it really be avoided? And she demonstrated the pro and the cons. The advantage of combining RAS blockade is to reduce proteinuria, but the harms are increasing, uh, increasing uh, the risk of hyperkalemia and reduction of GFR. And the trend is toward avoiding the combination of uh, RAS blockade. Interventional therapies. For hypertension, with the focus of Dr. Osama Shahat talk, who uh, uh, showed that renal denervation initially appeared to be a very successful adjuvant to medication in the treatment of refractory hypertension, but this excitement was tempered with simplicity three study. Baroreceptor activation therapy may also have a future role for these patients with severe hypertension. However, the current device. is too invasive and they need uh, special expertise. Management of dyslipidemia in coronary kidney disease and dialysis patients with the focus of Professor Ali Taha, who uh, demonstrated that people with coronary kidney disease have a substantially increased risk of cardiovascular disease, and this is the most important statement. And lipid assessment and treatment is an important aspect of their care. So we give a statin for the sake of the cardiovascular system. Coronary risk is sufficiently high to justify prescription of statin in people aged above uh, 50 years uh, with non-dialysis dependent CKD or a kidney transplant. Patients with dialysis dependent CKD shouldn't be initiated on lipid lowering therapy. Given the lack of evidence that uh, such treatment is beneficial, physicians should be alert to the possibility of toxicity resulting from substances that increase blood pressure, blood level of statins. Care should be taken with transplanted kidney patients as regard drug interactions between statin and immune suppressive drugs, especially cyclosporin and atorvastatin. How to retard the progression of coronary kidney disease is very important issue and a very important topic that was elegantly presented by Professor uh, Mona uh, Rojdi. And uh, all these are important factors, blood pressure, diabetes. And one of the important issues that I want to stress upon is uh, acidosis. We don't lie, we, we usually we neglect metabolic acidosis in early stages of coronary kidney disease. And I advocate, even in early stage of CKD, to encourage fruits and vegetables because they are natural sources of alkali. And later on, to consider alkali therapy uh, uh, because metabolic acidosis is bad for bone, for the you know, malnutrition um, risk factors, for CKD progression, and other problems. Professor Magda Sharawi highlighted the metabolic disorders. Uh, and the CKD progression, and he uh, discussed the issue of uh, hyperglycemia. Yes, hyperglycemia is a strong risk factor for CKD progression. However, the evidence pays for treating hyperglycemia by hyperglycemic drug is still lacking. But I think uh, he is convinced by using allobrinol rather than fibroxate in uh, treating the patients with chronic kidney disease and hyperuricemia. Metabolic syndrome has also been linked to CKD, but the relation is still to be proven. Dyslipidemia has the deleterious effect on CKD, but still the evidence of the benefits of statin treatment to slow progression of chronic kidney disease is yet to be proven. And as I mentioned before, we treat by statin for the sake of cardiovascular system. Obesity and increased fat mass not only promotes kidney disease indirectly through hypertension, atherosclerosis, and type 2 diabetes, but also through direct renal effects. The effects of weight reduction on CKD progression is yet to be properly evaluated. And then Professor Gamal Nagar discussed the issue of EBO resistance, and he showed that 
iron deficiency, inflammation, and many factors as shown in this slide uh, can explain the EBO resistance. So this is all these points should be brought in mind. One of the important presentation is, is uh, indecision kidney disease in elderly that was presented by Professor, Professor Robert Natch. And I like this slide. This is uh, the last slide of his presentation. The end of life uh, must be like this beautiful sunset. And uh, the uh, care of indecision kidney disease patients on dialysis requires expertise, not only in the medical maintenance of patients on dialysis, but also in the palliative care that uh, focuses on the management of pain and other symptoms, uh, ad advanced care planning, and attention to ethical, psychosocial, and spiritual issues related to uh, starting, continuing, withholding, and stopping dialysis. Then Professor Tara el -Baz, through his elegant presentation, discussed a very interesting issue about polycystic kidney disease and your hope on the horizon for autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease. And he showed again and again metformin has a pleiotropic effect and is beneficial in autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease. And this is the experimental hypothesis or clinical fact. This is the title of this uh, recent article. During the first year, the GFR decreased by 2.5% in metformin group and by 16% in controls. Thereafter, renal function remained stable in metformin group and further decreased in controls, reaching a 50% difference after three years of observation. Accordingly, the overall crude loss of GFR estimated by linear mixed model resulted slower in the metformin than control group. So this is a nice and, um, and exciting idea. Metformin is well tolerated and is associated with preserved renal function as shown uh, also from uh, this study. Another armamentarium is the vasopressin V2 receptor antagonist tolvaptan in polycystic kidney disease. At present, the most promising candidate for treatment of autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease. And Professor Tar uh, Elbaz mentioned this algorithm, and we should follow this algorithm for better treating our patients by these new drugs. And even uh, with discussion with Professor Tar Elbaz, we may even encourage uh, hydration and water drinking through the day uh, to bring urine either thenoric. By this way, we may even uh, uh, stimulate the switch off of endolytic hormone secretion. And by this way, it may be a very simple approach for uh, patients who can tolerate water drinking. Hepatitis C, uh, then the, this was the issue or, and the talk of Professor Maya Hasaballah. Uh, through, through presenting the, the most updated information and guidelines for hepatitis C management. And I like this slide, goodbye hepatitis C, it, is, it was a dream. And it seemed that we are approaching the uh, reality that we may uh, get rid of this virus. And she elegantly presented the success, the key elements of idea regimen of hepatitis C treatment uh, to not uh, eliminated by the kidney, highly effective, oral, uh, same regimen, binge notebook, safe and, uh, and uh, tolerable. And this uh, slide summarizes different uh, armamentariums of uh, direct uh, antiviral drugs, uh, discussing potency, genotype, uh, genotype uh, coverage, and barrier uh, to resistance. And this, these are the FDA approved direct antiviral agents, and these are the different regimens. And you can go to the guidelines to uh, read in details treatment and um, uh, prevention of uh, hepatitis C. Then Professor al Ghamdi mentioned the viral associated glomerulonephritis, and as you see, a lot of viruses can affect kidneys, and he demonstrated them elegantly. Then Dr. Mohammed Kamal discussed the treatment of membranous nephropathy and how antiphospholipase E2 receptor antibodies in serum and staining of the antigen tissues uh, change our mind in the treatment. So we add the titer 
to the uh, evaluation and risk of management, evaluation of serum autoantibody titer and the proteinuria together with serum albumin could guide diagnosis of membranous nephropathy and individually tailor treatment protocols. Conventional non-specific and toxic immune suppressive regimens will become treatment of the past to be replaced by more disease-specific and safer medications such as B-cell targeting immunoclonal antibodies and autoreactive plasma cell inhibitors, and we need uh, further studies. Treatment could be anticipated at earlier and milder stages of membranous nephropathy, even before the onset of nephrosis syndrome. However, uh, we still need further studies to agree upon this statement, but it is exciting. At least we shouldn't prolong the, the period for support treatment whenever we have a rising titer of antiphospholipase A2 antibodies. Patients who were previously left untreated so as not to expose them to the toxicity of cyclophosphamide might benefit of B-cell targeted therapy, which can prevent memory cell clone expansion, associated and control disease progression towards disease that's refractory to currently available therapies. Sport med supplements and their kidney and the kidney affection, myth and facts, was the topic of Dr. Sami Abu Zaid, and he elegantly presented that we should be careful about uh, the drugs and support and sports supplements uh, because excess dose may be hazardous to the patients. And then Professor Muntasr uh, Zaid presents biomarkers, uh, histopathology, and the immune suppressive medications for proliferative lupus nephritis and. Uh, uh, one of the key messages is biopsy is still the, uh, the best weapon for a diagnosis of lupus nephritis because the treatment is uh, uh, biopsy based. Then Professor Samir Sali discussed the issue of rituximab use in adult primary glomerulopathy and he concluded that current evidence supports the use of rituximab in steroid dependent and frequently relapsing minimal change disease, rituximab may be an effective alternative in the management of idiopathic membranes nephropathy. Available evidence was insufficient or is insufficient to support the use of rituximab in FSGS or IgA nephropathy. And it seems that there are preliminary results for uh, the rituximab, beneficial effects of rituximab in MBGN, uh, and the results are encouraging. Then vascular access monitoring and surveillance and vascular access salvage uh, were discussed by Professor Ali Sahawi from Al Kuwait and Professor Tamir Saeed from Ain Shams University. Then this is a difficult issue uh, how to optimize dialysis because our patients need optimization of dialysis. Professor Hisham Saeed mentioned that it is not only KT over V but we should look at dialysis in a global and KT over V is fine. The flux of membrane, time for dialysis, frequency of dialysis, and the good markers for nutritional ultrafiltration rate to be optimum. Everything should be in its, uh, uh, its optimum level to uh, enjoy the, dialysis, the adequate dialysis. And all these should be put together in one basket. All optimization factors in one basket, including nutritional anemia, etc. Then, Professor Mohammed Gunaimat the presented elegantly the cardiovascular risk management in hemodialysis patients, and this is a very wide topic. And he stated upon the treatment of hypertension, diabetes, dyslipidemia, arrhythmias, a lot of issues were elegantly discussed and to be brought in mind while we are treating CKD and dialysis patients. Intradialytic hypertension was the, the topic of Dr. Tari Tantawi, and intradialytic hypertension is one of the important issues because it is usually overlooked and the treatment is very difficult, but he insisted upon the better refinement of dry body weight and to avoid as we can, the um, highly dialyzable drugs like ACE inhibitors. Iatrogenic hyponatremia after the, uh, in the obstetric ward was the issue of Dr. Fouad, the, uh, who presented 
the uh, issue of hyponatremia and one of important messages is that we should discuss with the obstetrician and the surgeon about the issue of hyponatremia and to monitor the hyponatremia and even in certain cases if there is a rapid correction which has to monitor the patients and um, the uh, the hyponatremia resolve it safely nephropathy was discussed by professor Harry Wakil and uh, the there is a moderate risk uh, mo in moderate risk patients need optimal supportive care namely rasplocate and a bit on the blood pressure control together with uh, others as fish oil and thrombotic statins and tonsillectomy. Higher risk patients need short course of steroid in addition to optimal supportive care. Uh, crescentic IgA uh, nephropathy should be treated aggressively as crescentic anca vasculitis. Calthemimetic versus parathyroidectomy, I think both of them are needed uh, in managing severe hyper parathyroidism and this was the focus of Professor Ali Abu Alfa. Then Professor Muhammad Nasrallah uh, delivered two presentations, one about the diagnosis of vascular calcification and the other in the evolution of anemia management. And then Professor Ahmad Al-Korea presented his ideas about the renal nutrition and the how to optimize the nutritional aspects for the the care of the patients with chronic kidney disease. Kidney bed donation was uh, the talk of uh, Professor Adel Pak, and this uh, this is a very I think is a very nice uh, um, the armamentarium to be added to our patients. And instead of thinking of desensitization, we may think of kidney bed donation, and this will uh, solve the problem of highly sensitized patients. Uh, in uh, our locality, and we need uh, uh, the logistics for the availability of kidney per donation in our country. Then Professor Gamal Saadi, through his presentation about the evolution of immune suppressive monitoring and biomarkers, and in the immune suppressive treatments, and it uh, the highlighted that we need to know uh, the risk. So uh, the immune suppressive uh, prescription should be based on risk stratification, and we should know that there is variability and, the, and there is inherent variations of immune response that mandate individualization of treatment. Pharmacogenomics constitution dictates selection of immune suppression. Efficient biomarkers should be practical, feasible, validated, and cheap. And then Professor Anna Havers. Uh, presented the malignancies in tra and transplantation. He started with the case, and then he reviewed uh, very interesting issues like incidence of cancer after transplantation, risk factors of cancer, pre-transplant cancer guidelines, cancer mortality, cancer screening, and types of immune suppressive drugs, and uh, their modification for managing the uh, cancer or malignancy. And the, then uh, recurrent FGS and the post-transplant and SUPAR, and this was the presentation of Professor Tariq Fayyad, and uh, as he uh, concluded that recurrent FSHS is still mysterious, frequent associated with a poor allograft survival. Uh, to measure or not to measure circulating factor is not an easy task, and CD20 antibodies may be promising, and CD40 is undergoing evaluation, abatacept and ablatacept don't induce remission. And the, as I mentioned, that we add the all lectures to the Egyptian Society of Nephrology Virtual Academy. I am very proud by this site. Today we reached this uh, uh, figure uh, uh, for lectures and videos, and these are the number of uh, users. Uh, we are approaching thirty thousands. So the, the this is just uh, because we are believing in living through learning, we are believing in education and learning. And I would like to end this uh, highlights by the statement of Professor Tai El Baz that uh, if we have any success in this meeting, because we are working in a team, it is all about teamwork. Because team means together, everyone achieves more. And thank you very much, hoping you the best, and thank you for your attention.